Okay, we're live. Uh, hello, world. Hello, America. Hello, El Dorado, Kansas. This is Caden Runnels at Seeking Context, and I'm here for the first time on this podcast, or as a returning guest, and I guess a returning host. That's all I'm good for on this podcast is interviewing you. But uh, <laughs> we have a returning guest of Mr. Bob Peterson. He uh, Last episode, I went on a big spiel about all your accomplishments and everything you've done. Hmm. And we're going to skip it this time. But if anyone... Was, Why? <laughs> I, well, I don't I have... I want to double sell like, <laughs> all the publicity I could get. Well, if anyone it's, 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 wants to hear it, go back to that well, last episode. Well, you know what I should do is, is just start pulling plaques off the wall. You should. And, 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 you know, and Oscars and things like that going, okay, and you know, be great. It's now like we've a, cheesed them. Did he really win that Oscar? Mm -hmm. Now we've we've got it. We've, we've got it. We've trapped all five people watching this now. That's exactly. they're not going to leave they're not going to leave because <laughs> did he win the oscar or didn't he <laughs> so if you want to know if you won the oscar go back to that last episode i think it was episode 19 and we're on like 30 now so uh it's a few episodes back and i've aged <laughs> since 19 to 30. <laughs> haven't but we all have aged you know it's no one's got younger hmm. so that I, was profound that was really a profound statement. No one's got your boy. Stick with us, folks. It's gonna be old. these pearls of wisdom are dropping like crazy. I mean, I need to drop one on them. Okay. We're, we're a minute and 30 seconds in. Yeah, we're and we've already had philosophy. Well, okay, let's jump right into it. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to ask you about this week we are starting children's theater mm -hmm. and uh, we're opening truly frank this tuesday mm -hmm. uh to about a hundred and some kids so oh there's some advertisement truly frank see i told you i pass, pull stuff off the walls okay go ahead so uh, that's okay no, this is your interview I have no yeah well here i'll let i'll give it off to you what is okay. truly frank true truly frank I'm so suppressing a, you, that is a setup line if I've ever heard one. That, you know, I say truly frank is you know something I I never was with my girlfriend <laughs> in high school. You know, but the, <laughs> cut that out. Just cut this. This is I'm sorry. It's nine o'clock in the morning. I've had half a cup of coffee, and that's where I am. <laughs> truly frank, seriously, folks. Uh, truly frank is a children's theater story uh, that I wrote, but it's based on. Uh, a, two people basically, or a person and an animal, a young man named Frank and his uh, best friend who happens to be an alligator. And this is a series of them. The first one was called Totally Frank, and then there was Completely Frank, and then there was Being Frank, and there was Uniquely Frank, and this one is called Truly Frank in the series. Uh, so they're little, in some way, morality tales uh, because they teach a lesson because, uh, as I think I said this last time, but the fairy tales were created for that reason to teach a value and so it's really important that uh the elementary school children who see the show will walk away hopefully entertained and had a great time in the theater but with a lesson learned and this show is about accepting people and tolerance and i it's a rewrite of totally frank as a matter of fact and the reason i wanted to rewrite it and adjust it and give it a new ending and all that stuff is because I think right now we're in a climate where we need to really be tolerant and really accept everyone for whom, who, who they are, whom they are. Some English teacher fixed that, but, but accept them for who they are. And so, uh, and that's with all the children's theater shows that I've done is that they all have a theme, a lesson, a moral to be taken uh, from them um, so yeah, true, truly Frank is about Franklin Osborne Barrett Digby Jr. the fourth and his best friend Alvin the Alligator. And um, it all takes place on the Digby Prep School campus, a fictional prep school campus that I made up out of my head. And the reason I made that up out of my head, it's the school that I really wish I had gone to as a kid. You know, that would have been so much fun because everybody wore preppy clothes and lived by the official preppy handbook. What's but what's but is it? Oh, there, oh, there we there go. go. There you go. You know, that's, so the, there you are. So uh, yeah, so that's truly Frank. And so the it's so you said it was a rewrite of Totally Frank. Yeah. Which when did you first write Totally Frank? Twenty years ago. Twenty years ago. And you yeah, I wrote it in twenty twenty no twenty oh two, and I think I got it right. Even though 
so much of the original script is still there. Probably three fourths of the original script is still there. Uh, I've just added characters, adjusted things, and wrote a new ending, which I like. Uh, and so that's, I think I got it right now. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think I finally got after it right. The third to, rewrite. Yeah, after third rewrite. 20, 20 years later, third rewrite, and <sighs> two liters of Coca Cola later. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I have it. So we, so you did totally Frank, and then after that, uh, you had some other stories with Alvin and yeah. Frank. Yeah, what do you mean without with Alvin and with, Frank or without? Well, him? didn't it start off with just Alvin going off? And yeah, Alvin went on his own, and mm -hmm. he left Frank behind, and he went to Hollywood in a show called Hollywood Days which was the theme of that because at that time when I wrote it, there was this whole big drug problem. Nancy Reagan was saying just say no. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I took that as the springboard and Hollywood days, it was spelled D-A-Z-E -E, as if you're in a days of drugs. Yeah. That's really Perfect. Good. That's good. Yeah. And so, but I liked that show a lot. Now it was nothing more than the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But as I think I discussed in episode 19, I, I'm not sure if it's you know, 19, 20 but. episodes ago uh, is that there are no new stories hmm. you just plot them differently and so i liked it and then the next one he went uh out west and it was called band together and it was about a small western town that was trying to form a community band and had a, you know the mayor was tacky and often or whatever and uh alvin drives through town and puts it all together and blah 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 and then i wrote one that i thought was real interesting it was called spaced out alvin went to outer space he ended up going to this museum the space museum and you know of course alvin got in the rocket hit the wrong button and he lands up on this do a luna planet you know with an evil princess and the whole nine yards yeah and, and, and don't get me wrong i liked it it was very funny in fact a lot of people have said to me that's the one they liked the best when he went out on his own was spaced out and uh uh then i i no i wanted him to bring him back home to campus he missed frank and i i missed working with the digby campus characters and i in the different shows characters reappear in and out you know sue chef is the school cafeteria there's cheerleaders there's tennis players there's but mr chiplings the school headmaster miss chadwick the wonderful storyteller english teacher and frank and alvin appear in all of them mm -hmm. so that's so then when you got done with doing just Alvin on a solo stories, mm -hmm. you went back, mm -hmm. did that first story again. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you did two more of on campus, kind of yeah. making a trilogy. Right. Being Frank and uniquely Frank. Mm -hmm. And in being Frank, he runs for office. Mm -hmm. He runs for the class of the school presidency of Digby, Digby Prep School. And I liked it very much because this is true for the plot of that, because everything you should do is based in some kind of reality, based in some kind of truth. Uh, I looked up now, you're gonna lose, okay, we have five people watching, we're gonna lose two and a half of them now. <laughs> I based it on Roger Stone and what he did as a kid when he got into politics in grade school. And I went, this is fascinating, you can't write this. And I couldn't, so I stole it and just said, okay, you know, because I mean, things that had to do with, you know, lunches in the cafeteria and more desserts in the cafeteria and all that kind of stuff. But I based it on that and I liked it very much. However, it was the only one of the Frank stories and Alvin stories that doesn't have a wishing well. The wishing well is in the sunken garden on Digby campus. Is this, is this boring the audience? No, no. And no, so, no. um, uh, I had to include the same set. It had to be the setting on the Digby campus in the wishing well, you throw, you know, three coins in the fountain and your wishes come true and all that. And so, yeah, it was pretty fun. So, yeah. And then the last year I did, or two years ago, because of COVID, we didn't do one yesterday, last year, um, uniquely Frank in which was the Freaky Friday story. Uh, you know, Frank just wishes he could be somebody else for a day and the coin goes into the fountain and Frank and Alvin change places. So Frank is in Alvin's body. Alvin is in Frank's body and all that confusion. And mm -hmm. that was great fun. So, yeah. So when writing the children's show, most and usually just the Frank and Alvin stories. So mm -hmm. each character is based off of a real life mm -hmm. interpretation of someone, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, it has to be because, you know, Neil Simon said that when he wrote his wonderful work and the only play of his that he doesn't like, which I happen to like, is Star Spangled Girl. And I like it. I think it's a charming show. I've directed it. And I think it's, you know, it's very, okay. I hate cute, but it is cute. Um, 
he said the reason he doesn't like to play is because he based didn't base those characters on people he knew. They were just figments of his imagination came out of his head. So even in children's theater, everything you write has to have some germ of truth. Mm -hmm. And so all of those characters are based, even sous chef, the cranky cafeteria lady, she's based on somebody I knew as a kid. Hmm. Um, that's important. And even the tennis players that seem like maybe the, the, the dummy character, oh, we just had a visitor, <laughs> almost an intrusion. <laughs> I won't go there. Okay. Uh, I was ready to go for something like, you know, they're, they're storming the office, but let's not go there. So at any rate, um, even the tennis players, and there, there are seven of them, they're all based on some way, some person uh, I know, mm -hmm. you know. And do you find you have to, when you write stories, uh, which we'll get into in a bit, but when you write, do you need to base everything off of some grounded element? Or I do, yes. I think that's important that it has... And it's certainly your imagination takes co over and certainly you can invent things. Absolutely. But it has to start in some reality, some truth, mm -hmm. you know, and going there, the reality, as long as it's when the world of the play, let's go with Mary Poppins. She flies in on and on in on an umbrella. Mm -hmm. Well, no one does that. I mean, I've known, Okay, I'm just going to try to suppress something here. You know, I've known, no, no, don't go there. Uh, so I'll tell you afterwards. So at any rate, it, it had to do with a broom, but, you know, oh, okay, you okay. know no, riding, a of... riding a broom. No. But uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, Mary Poppins flies in on an umbrella. Is that real? Yes, because it's in the world of that play. It's in the rules of that play. Do they jump into chalk, uh, sidewalk chalk pictures? Is that real? Yes, it's in the world of that story and if you set the rules that's cool but you can't break the rules mm -hmm. like for instance in on my in my shows digby campus if you turn around three times kiss your class ring and throw it into the well you're you can get a wish does that happen no <laughs> however in the world of digby prep school that can happen and by the way the sunken garden mm -hmm. that whole came that all came from emporia state university that indeed has a sunken garden with a fountain in the middle mm. where you can throw in pennies. And that's where that came from. So everything you do has to have a germ of truth, a germ of reality. Then you can invent and, you know, have Mary Poppins fly and have wishes come true and all that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it has to have some honesty about it mm -hmm. in the, from the get go. And when you wrote, Alvin, the mm -hmm. alligator. Mm -hmm. Was there a reason it was an alligator? Was it Lacoste or? Yeah, that's interesting because mm -hmm. Lacoste is a crocodile. Crocodile. So there's source. no copyright no issues co here. <laughs> there's no, you know, I checked all that out. But it was because I loved wearing Lacoste and I thought, wouldn't that be interesting? So I thought, well, it's a little crocodile. You can't use that. It's an alligator and it pops off the, he, he came off the shirt and came to life, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And that's so, why you picked the alligator and not, you know, a, a badger or something. Yeah. And, and I think alligators through the years have gotten a bad rap. You do. And I wanted to give them kind of a a boost of, you know, they're, they're okay. In the early 2000s, Steve Irwin was wrestling them and, you know. Yeah. You know, in the original, Totally Frank, at one point, we get to the end of the story and it's all a happy ending. And then the lights freeze and the actor playing Frank steps forward and looks at the audience. This happened in the first production and said... This is just a, 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 a Alvin is a symbolism of blah, 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 blah. Do not play with alligators. They will hurt you. And then we went back into the story. And so I, we actually did that. That seems kind of like a slap in the face to any little kid. Yeah, it. exactly. Because, you know, there, and we'll, we had little first graders running out screaming. And so, <laughs> well, well, maybe, you know, I just bought that kitty year of therapy. Maybe we shouldn't do that. So I cut that. You cut that line. Mm -hmm. You didn't need it anymore. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not in this show. Uh, okay, well, so other than the Frank stories, you've done a lot of other writing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you've wrote a lot of children's shows. Mm -hmm. So what are I, you've told me a few. But... Yeah, well, I took well-known fairy tales, mm -hmm. which are in public domain and set them in different locations. Like I took uh, Cinderella and set it in Japan called a Kabuki Cinderella. I took uh, The Emperor's New Clothes and I've written it twice. Once I set it in ancient Egypt and called it Pharaoh's Fashion. Fashion spelled P-H-A-S-H-I-O-N, thank you. Uh, I also did it and called it First Gent 
because it was uh, the story of John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy and bringing the Mona Lisa over from, you know, and Jackie Kennedy. It was a history lesson. Um, also, the Pineapple Jack, which was indeed uh, Jack and the Beanstalk set in Hawaii. Um, mm, let's see. Uh, oh, my! one of my favorite was Great Scott, which was the story set in Scotland of the Loch Ness Monster, mm. uh, which was sort of a germ of Alvin. So there you go. So I, I like taking well-known fairy tales and putting them in a new land, uh, which is great fun. And is that just pulling a random, you know, genre or location out of a hat? No, or... actually, I think each fairy tale lends itself to a location mm -hmm. better than the other location. Right. So, You're not going to put... Yeah, I just love the idea of, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk set in Hawaii. That was you, know, you know, they got palm trees, they got they got pineapples. Hello. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, <laughs> what more do you want? Uh, so, there you have it. There you have it. So, that's the other children's shows. Is there any... Mm -hmm. But your your as you say your Mickey Mouse is Alvin the Alvin Alvin, Alvin is my Mickey. Got it. Mm -hmm. Well, on top of just children shows, you wrote you know some regular straight straight shows. Right. Uh, full length, yeah, full length. Full length uh, plays for the mature audience. That's right. I mean, some of these children shows deep deal with very deep subjects, mm -hmm. but uh, one of I feel like you're most famous for is. I, it would be titled Heaven's Ajar now, right? which we can talk about. Uh, what What is Heaven's Ajar? Oh, it's, it's Heaven Ajar. Heaven Ajar. No apostrophe S on Heaven. Heaven Ajar. Because that's from Mrs. Coolidge's poem. <laughs> it is the story of the Coolidge family in the White House in the summer of 1924 when their youngest son, Calvin Coolidge Jr., um, developed a blister on his toe and died mm -hmm. of, of uh, poisoning. Of poisoning. So... Um, I, that always fascinated me because I, I read about that story when I was a little kid in the National Geographic. And uh, I was a boy, I wasn't a little kid. And uh, uh, that always stuck with me. And so I, I was privileged to interview the surviving brother when he was like 88 years old, John Coolidge, mm -hmm. uh, President and Mrs. Coolidge's oldest son. And uh, he talked with me about it. And so I, 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 I've lived that my whole life. Mm -hmm. I'm very, I won't, you know, I'll take that one with me too. The grave. It's just uh, a story. In fact, my pictures over here are all of the Coolidge family and, and vintage pictures. So yeah, so I uh, am fascinated by that story. That piece of history is really fascinates mm -hmm. me. And so. after you did that interview, wasn't there the library? Of, mm -hmm. They asked. Yeah, the, uh, the the Coolidge Library that has asked me for the uh, interview, the tape. It's an old cassette tape, and uh, I will give that to them. Uh, when I'm in repose. <laughs> okay, so you've done the show multiple times. Yeah. And you've three, re three and you've rewrote it mm -hmm. a few times. Mm -hmm. And each time you gave it a different title, correct? No, I gave it Heaven, Heaven, Heaven Ajar the first two times. And the last time I gave it the title Angel's Charge. Mm -hmm. It's from the 90th something Psalm. He will give his angels charge over you to protect you in all your ways. And uh, I loved it because when I put that on the posters, Angel's Charge, and did it here a few years ago, the English faculty was all a Twitter when they saw the poster because should angels be an apostrophe, S or S apostrophe or whatever. And I said, guys, read the Bible. Shame and crime, and, you know, come on, let's, 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 let's shape it up. Let's get a little moral here, you know, some morals. Let's read the Bible. And so then I, of course, proved my colleagues in the yeah, you English department all wrong. It was very popular at the conference meeting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nobody would sit with me at the table. Let me tell you. Then I brought donuts. <laughs> a Bible in one hand and a pack of Krispy Kreme. And yeah. Still and I couldn't them. attract a crowd. <laughs> you know, I drive them away. So, so with the renaming convention, you also did that with the uh, the children's show every time you rewrote mm -hmm. a certain sh is mm -hmm. usually the first one mm -hmm. you would rename it right why do you feel like you have to rename after you did maybe even minor tweaks or minor rewrites um i don't know maybe it's just just to keep me fresh mm -hmm. to keep it fresh to keep it to keep it clicking um and also i do think the new the new title fits the show better mm -hmm. and that's one reason you do it is to keep this title is more reflective of uh, what the story is about. Mm -hmm. And by the way, titles are everything. You know, a good title can sell a show that 
otherwise, you know, you couldn't get out of the Bahamas. I mean, it's just what did that it's, mean? I don't. I don't know. But I. It was very clever. No one knows what it means. I was groping, but it's provocative. But, yeah, we we've lost. There's only like three people left watching because we've lost them. But that's They're like, okay. what are, that guy's talking about leaving the Bahamas. Yeah, okay, great. Um, oh, let me get in frame. Okay, that's here right. we go. Reset. Uh, it's just we, well, what was I, when I was trying to talk about the titles, yeah. and we talked about the Bahamas for a second. Yeah, uh, but, but renaming the show because it was more reflective of what the show was about. Right. Just a better title. Oh, but in fact, that happened a lot. Uh, you know, um, but Tennessee Williams used to do that. Uh, all the time. In fact, Summer Smoke, Summer and Smoke was originally named, I think, The Night of the Nightingale or something. Uh, the musical Matahari, which didn't work on Broadway. I mean, it went from the ballad of the the gunfighter to the blah, blah, blah. I mean, they changed titles, you know, mm -hmm. a lot. So when it's it, just reflective of what the show is. Oh, well, when it, I guess when marketing a show uh, is that, you know, don't judge a book by its cover, yeah. but, you know, yeah. judge a play by its title. Yeah. Well, in some ways, because you have to, have, the title is the hook, mm -hmm. you know, like there are certain titles that I, I like, look, ah, mm. when Truman Capote wrote Breakfast at Tiffany's, that's the greatest title in the world. One of the greatest titles. I mean, that just, you want to watch it. And it was originally, and then as a joke, I remember, the publishing house or whatever said, okay, let's, let's, let's mess with Truman's mind. And uh, they decided they were going to call it some other thing. I don't even remember what they were going to call it, but they wrote him and said, we think we should call it this. And of course they were just it's playing, you know, yeah. just yanking his chain. And he was like, oh, whoa. Hmm. And he said, no, you can't do that. So oh, that, titles that, are that isn't cool. Um, sure it is. A, titles <laughs> are, are everything. everything. Yeah. So on top of writing, which you, I don't know if this is, uh, you want to take he Heaven Ajar mm -hmm. farther past mm -hmm. oh, stage yeah. production. Absolutely. So if there's anyone out there who wants to pick up a really good play. There you go. And it centers around the, the, Coolidge, two, the two Coolidge, Coolidge boys. boys. Yeah, it's, okay. it's written for an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, I really, uh, I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. Very, very proud of it. So, yeah, there he is. Well, on top of that, you've wrote a lot of other shows, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess we can talk about The Daily Grind next. Yeah, yeah. The Daily Grind is three one-act plays set in the same coffee shop. It's sort of like how Neil Simon would write three plays set in a ho uh, in, you know, in the Plaza Hotel. Noel Coward did that also. But a lot of playwrights have done that. But it's uh, there's a – when I was on my sabbatical in 1996, Caden wasn't born. That's right. Uh, there was a, a wonderful little coffee shop I went to almost every morning called The Daily Grind. And it was really fun to see and just sit and have my coffee. And by the way, I was a regular. You know, by the second week, I'd walk in and they knew what kind of coffee to get, they got, to get me, which was really inventive. Just coffee, Folgers, <laughs> and everybody's ordering latte with a fa-fa <laughs> and a little swish, <laughs> an extra scourge of caffeine. I just said, give me a cup of coffee. Anyway, they knew. So anyway, but I became... A regular, a, regular. a regular. And I would sit in the mornings and read the Los Angeles Times and watch these people. Mm. And I thought this would be wonderful to have a play, three one acts written about what happens in a coffee shop. Mm. And so, yeah, it was really fun. I staged it here and it was really a very successful experience. Mm -hmm. Really love doing it. It's great fun. So. And you, I, for me, I really don't know a lot about it. I've seen some pictures, but what's stuck around is the logo. Yeah. There's a Daily Grind logo. That's, yeah. You can find it everywhere throughout the theater. Mm -hmm. um, it's a mug with steam coming out. It's the Daily Ground mm -hmm. Grind. Where did that come from? Greg May, our, from May Design, mm -hmm. uh, our graphic designer who designs all of our posters, he came up with that design. Mm -hmm. And you put that on mugs. We and... put it on the mugs for the props because you know, blah blah blah. So we did a, we did, you know, and it was on a sign. In fact, that sign that was in the cafe or the coffee shop itself is now hanging in the scene shop. Mm -hmm. And we did posters. Uh, and we did uh, t-shirts. Wow. And like that, them there. But, but the famous thing was the mugs because we ordered mugs that had the Daily Grind logo on them, and of course, then they were the coveted item. Everybody had to have a. A a mug. Daily grind mug. Yeah, exactly. Why not? Uh, and so you 
pick you all you thought this would be something good to write when you were in a sabbatical in California. Yeah, it, that gave me the inspiration. And it, was there anything else that you got inspiration from? If it wasn't even on your sabbatical, on the yeah. Other shows. Well, the, uh, the show, uh, one of my favorite shows that I've written was called Saturday's Child, mm -hmm. and uh, it was based on uh, a friend of mine and her mother. They had the most interesting relationship, and I thought, whoa! So I would. They didn't realize I was following them around and had a little notepad. <laughs> I was writing down everything they said. It was fascinating, and so Saturday's Child is about a girl. Mm -hmm. and her mother. And it's interesting because this is when Miss America was something, you know, really special and neat. And it was before cell phones and social media and all that. But I wrote it as the girl whose name was Tuesday uh, became Miss America. And she came home mm -hmm. to Topeka, Kansas for her homecoming deal and the intense relationship she had with her mother and what that instant fame did to her family and her relationship and it was interesting because the woman on whom i based the mother my friend's mother saw the show mm -hmm. didn't speak to me for a month afterwards Oops. yeah she said how dare you how dare you and i thought well i'm like you know with truman capote when he you know he wrote um answered prayers he was writing all the things that people had told him he said yeah, well you as truman capote says you takes your chances <laughs> So there you go. But that said, she and I, but what was interesting about that story, my friend's mother said, how dare you? You know, because you know, she recognized herself. I had so many people come up to me after that play. I've done, I don't have enough fingers on my hand, hands to count the number of, of girls or women who came up to me and said, how did you know? Hmm. And I said, no, what? That's my story. That's my relationship with my daughter, or that's the relationship with my mother. And I think so it's, I think it's universal. All mothers and daughters have certain aspects of the relationship that are there, that are competition, that are whatever. And I thought, well, you know, it wasn't about you, it was about somebody else. But that goes back to everything you do must be based to be successful, to have integrity, needs to be based in a germ of truth, mm -hmm. needs to be have honesty about it. Yeah. And you also mentioned, I remember you saying, telling me that story and you said that when you write something the more broad or i more, guess no more the more specific. specific you are the more it will be more universal of course yeah the more specific you are the more universal its appeal mm -hmm. and the more everybody identifies with it you can't write in generalities you know you, you, you can't write in a concept you know no matter what Catherine houghton says on the documentary of guests who's coming to dinner you can't write about an idea you got to write about a specific thing hmm. so and then the idea comes from that well after oh, well, acting 101 i mean dr playwriting 101 i love it this is great this is free information yeah for uh, the tutorial you know the, the <laughs> textbook to follow so <laughs> what would your textbook be called uh well okay Interesting. Because I know your book, I remember I asked you, what would your memoir be last? And I think you said never too much rehearsal. Never too much rehearsal. But now your uh, textbook, uh, Spatter is your friend. Spatters, that's, my, that's my technical theater book. Um, that would be interesting. I haven't thought about my textbook, what I would write. I think it would be called something like, you know, burn the midnight oil. I don't know. <laughs> or have an extra ribbon cartridge. That's when you had typewriters. <laughs> or have more, you know, have another ink thing for your printer. Maybe uh, that's it. Extra cartridge of ink. That's will be the title. That'll be your title of your directing textbook or your uh, theater textbook. Theater textbook. Oh, well, great. Uh, so we talked about having a jar. We talked about Saturday's, Saturday's child. child. So we also what what is front porch? Oh, front, about? oh, front porch. Front porch. I like first act's good. Second act. Mm. <laughs> you wrote it. Uh, well, no, no. It, 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 as Mary Jane Teal would say, cling to me, kids. Okay, so that said, front porch. Front porch. It's based on when my father accompanied me and rode with me out to Vermont to interview John Coolidge. My dad went with me. Hmm. We had a road trip. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that, that was an interesting dynamic. And then we parked the car in Massachusetts. This is all true. And went into New York City and saw Into the Woods and blah, 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 some Broadway shows. And then we, you know, took the train back to some little town in Massachusetts, picked up the rented car and came home. I thought there's a play here. Hmm. 
And so honestly, Front Porch is the story. Uh, it, it's based on my dad and me. Mm -hmm. And I, I like it. And I, 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 by the way, interesting, that title, good title. That was the first title, the working title of William Inge's Picnic. And he later called Picnic Picnic. But his first rewrite, his first draft of the play Picnic was called Front Porch. And I thought, wow, what a fantastic title. Why did he lose it? I'll, I'll take it. If he's not going to use it, I'll take it. And I love the title. And it is in Act Two. There is something I like about Act Two. But the, the title, Front Porch, clicks. This is why it's called Front Porch. And uh, I like the show. Mm -hmm. I like it very much. I want to rewrite it. And uh, I don't act much anymore. I don't go on stage anymore very well, but I, well, we'll get into uh, that. But go but ahead. but I I would like to do that show one more time, and I would like to play the father. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be interesting. How strange that you said the father. Yeah, because yeah. This yeah. summer, or no, it wasn't. It, it was, was November. This November. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the exact opposite of summer. Right. Exactly. Uh, so. <laughs> Then he, you know, <laughs> you're from Conway Springs, That's so right. excuse it. Yeah. All right. Okay. The five people watching from Conway Springs have now just written they letters. Off. Okay. I know. Send you the know. letters to Caden, not me. That's right. Uh, you know, I know how to milk a cow, and that's about it. Uh, so, don't look at me like I'm that. All no. <laughs> oh, okay. no. By the way, that's that's great. I. I can't milk a cow because, you know, I, I, I had my best friend in grade school, his father owned a dairy farm and they didn't, you know, they milk cows by machines. Yeah. Okay. Good. You, did you do that? Too? Yeah. Well, what? I wasn't out there on a, on a stool and a pail, you know, why is this interview about you now? This was, <laughs> it was supposed to be about me. All of a sudden, you're the, you're the one all that said, sudden, you know, farmhand tips with Kane Reynolds. You questioned my... the farm report. Okay. Here we go. What the hell are we talking okay. about? Okay, we were talking about front porch. Oh, and then no, then we were talking about the father. The father, because you want to play the father. Well, you already played yeah. a father. Yeah, I played the father in the father. In the father, what was you said? You don't have a lot of acting left in you, but mm -hmm. you did last semester in November, not the summer. Right. You played. Uh, what's it? I've already forgotten. Antoine. Antoine, I, and you. Uh, what What is the story of the father about? It's a story about uh, a gentleman who is suffering dementia, beginning stages of Alzheimer's, and how his daughter has to cope with that. And uh, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, a tricky thing. And so it's not, a, not an uplifting no. Neil Simon comedy. And so it's the story of, of a, a gentleman who um, is going through that phase and going mm -hmm. through that transition and that passage. So very, very intense show, mm -hmm. very intense. Did you... Do you feel like you've learned something? From oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, you know that, you know, you learn, I think you learn something from every show you do, mm -hmm. um, no matter what it is. Because even if it's a bad experience, you learn something. This is not how to do it. But uh, no, I learned a lot from that and I enjoyed the experience and mm -hmm. had a very good people to work with and, you know, good director, good cast. It was a very good experience. Yeah, I liked it like doing it but i couldn't keep doing the show because it, you know it was just too intense uh, well so. I, I noticed that because i helped you learn some lines during yes the you semester. did and thank you uh, well of course you know it, don't forget it uh I, and i and i also i saw that the more and more you did it the more it wears you out and mm -hmm. it, obviously when i saw it uh in the thrust that it it really was um I guess it was, it was in the round. It was in the round because, yeah. but anyway, when I saw it, it was it was fantastic. You felt like you were there. You gave a. It was I think my first time ever seeing you actually perform outside mm. of uh, in classroom when I'm doing shtick. That too, always performing. Uh, well, then the Crude Oasis, which oh yeah, I guess that was. I like that film. Yeah. Well, I mean, did. We, did we really talk about it in the last episode? I don't think we did. I know I mentioned the crude oasis, but right. well, I guess while we're here, what it, what's the crude oasis for anyone? The crude oasis. Know? It was Alex Graves's first feature film. Of course, he went on to direct and produce The West Wing, mm -hmm. uh, Game of Thrones, some other uh, t television shows, uh, episodes he directed, and he is a, a very fine director. He's from El Dorado, Kansas, and mm -hmm. so uh, you know he he said to me he would come back. I think we did talk about this last time that he would come back during the summers when he was a student at USC, a 
film student. And he would have a project to do, a film, a short film and 15 minute film in the summer or 30 minute, and, and then take it back to his class and they'd work on it and critique it. Whatever. And I always did his films for him. And I'd get up in the morning at 3 a.m. to do a scene that he needed in the middle of it. Just, you know, I was glad to do this very fun. Mm -hmm. And he always said, you know, Bob, when I do my first feature, I'm going to write a part for you. And I thought, OK, sure. he did. <laughs> <laughs> and it was great. And it was uh, really, really. Miramax bought the film. It played all the art houses in New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, Kansas City, Dallas, uh, Cleveland, you know, I don't know, you know, those. And it was great fun. It was really, really fun. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful little movie. It's a very moody little movie. And uh, I like it. And I'm very proud to have been in it. When did that come out? That was... uh, it, came, it was filmed in 92, 94, 92. but it came out. It was released. Miramax picked it up in 95. Okay. I I, th I was trying to get this. So from 95 and then now to 20, I guess it was 20, 21, 21 since yeah. when you did The Father. Yeah. But oh, obviously yeah. you've done acting in between there. Right. Uh, but the, since that was, that would be the first time in The Father that I saw you perform. And it really, uh, all your work did come to fruition with that show. It was, it was, it was amazing. I wish well, that there you. was a video of it, but. Thank you. That's, um, I guess that is something with theater is that it's almost better not to have footage of it. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that. They talk about Ben Gazzara in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof in the 1955, yeah, on Broadway. And there were no microphones and in no amplification, no electronics. And you could hear him supposedly on the back row of the big, you know, theater, the Barrymore Theater or whatever, you know, the big Broadway house, you could hear him perfectly and people raved about him, etc. It is interesting. They found footage of someone who had, in 1955, what kind of film they had, but a few feet of film of him doing the role hmm. with sound. Of course, it had to be like a big movie camera. And it's very interesting. I say this so respectfully and so humbly. But it's a little hokey. Mm -hmm. Maggie, what do you mean you and Skipper were, you know, it's like, and, and he was doing that so he could be heard on the back row, of course. But I, I, it was very interesting. I thought, you know what? The myth, would, the legend would have been better mm -hmm. without knowing and seeing that. I would rather have had the legend. Um, so there you are. Well, that's, yeah. So maybe. I talk a big game about the father, and if people saw it, they'd say, "Well, I don't know. <laughs> that Bob Peterson." Peterson, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I will, I will, uh, I appreciate you saying all that, and I will, will accept the, uh, I'll accept <laughs> the legendary status. <laughs> well, after uh, well, we talked about your acting with the father just randomly, but we can go back to your writing one more time. Okay, good. <laughs> I said, "Okay, good." He laughs. I. Was just saying, when you said okay good it sounded like you're like thank, okay good. thank god i don't want to talk about no, that anymore no 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 I, he what just, was that he just dropped his notes whoa thank you did you guys see that um <laughs> well okay let's talk about the fa fashioned hearts is that what it's called fashioned hearts what is that i have no clue what that is yeah uh, i have students in my acting two class working on a monologue from fashion hearts for uh emotional triggers uh the unit you know, we're doing the, the, the technique the strategy of emotional emotional triggers fashioned hearts is a story based i taught when i was 23 years old to 27 years old i taught at what is now newman university when I taught there, the first year was called Sacred Heart College, and then it became Kansas Newman College, and now it's Newman University in Wichita, Kansas. I taught there. And I was, you know, I'm a good Methodist boy. I'm a good Protestant. And so, I, you know, I, you know, all I knew about nuns is that, uh, you know, Julie Andrews was great in The Sound of Music. That's all I knew. Uh, and so I, I, you know, the hills were alive with the sound of music. Wow. I mean, I thought the nuns got up every morning and ran through the hills singing. I didn't know. <laughs> well, they don't do that. And so, and so. What do the nuns do? What did they do? Well, they're, you know, I, let me just say this because I don't want to be sued. They're human beings. And like all human beings, they have, you know, they're not always sweet, like Julie Andrews singing The Hills Are Alive, or, you know, and when they got mean-spirited, they didn't, you know, steal the, the carburetor out of the Nazi's car. 
you know, like I saw the end of the movie. You know, they they were human beings who had human frustrations and like all of us. And I found this fascinating. So I thought that would be an interesting play. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, the nuns didn't know what I was walking around, <laughs> writing down everything they were saying. And so it is my homage, no, it is my, based on my experience uh, at teaching at a, a Catholic university, mm -hmm. or then time, the Catholic college. And, you know, I, and by the way, I met some wonderful people. Mm -hmm. lovely people. There are a couple of people that I still keep in touch with there that are just the nicest people in the world. Um, but we all are human beings. Mm -hmm. And so we all have frustrations. We all have highs. We all have lows. We all have, we all can be benevolent. We all can be petty. We can be all of that. And so I found that fascinating because as a good Protestant boy, I just thought all the nuns were, you know, out of a cookie cutter and, and they were all, you know, Mother Teresa. They were all Mother Teresa. Right. Yeah, you know, they were either Julie Andrews singing or Mother Teresa saving lives. Mm -hmm. And no, we're all human beings. Hmm. So there you are. What so are, what, what are I kind of letters I'll get on this one? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get a letter from the, the, the Pope. The Pope. Yeah. <laughs> the Pope. If we get a letter from the Pope, I would thank you. That would, yeah, be, that would great. be great. Yeah, he'd be endorsing seeking context. Wouldn't that be cool? That would be, you know, what they say, publicity. There's no Any such kind thing of, as no bad publicity. That's right. Absolutely. So if I'm Pope, living proof. So. <laughs> I don't know where. <laughs> okay. Well, what did you, I don't think we ever said what exactly you said fashion hearts is about your experience. And so is there, is it about a young guy? And mm -hmm. so you, did you, you wrote in yourself. Mm -hmm. What is that? I have to ask, what is that like love writing it. yourself in love a it. show? I love it because you can make yourself fabulous. <laughs> You can get rid of all of your funnies and your, your your warts and everything, and you can make yourself anything you want to. It's it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I uh, no in 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 fashion hearts. I show the best of Bob Peterson. I think I, yeah. I do. You need that. Yeah, I, I boy do I need that. so I needed that. So I showed the best. But no, I enjoy doing it. And, and quite frankly, it's sometimes more difficult than you think because you are the worst judge of who you are. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm thinking about that. If I had to write myself, I would definitely be like a villain. Mm. Like I definitely, I would not be like a, a tragic hero or like you know the 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 moral mm -hmm. of the story. The protagonist. I would not be a protagonist. The I, antagonist. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I did that. I thought the timing on that was pretty good. That I, was, see that. I thought the timing was good on that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a lot of your life and stories and your events. Uh, have to do around, or at least are inspired by nuns. I don't, or I, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe mm -hmm. you just talk. It's, I think maybe I talk about them. I only taught there four years, but they definitely had a major influence on me. Hmm. And of course, everybody you meet is yes. your teacher. Mm -hmm. I do believe that you can learn something from every person you meet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, uh, you know, uh, I remember, uh, you know, the first time I, ever saw a sister and they were in full habit then. And I remember being fascinated by a person being dressed like that, walking downtown to shop. That mm -hmm. didn't make sense to me. But at any rate, because I was good, 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 good Methodist, Protestant, good Methodist, oh, good me. Protestant boy. So there you go. Yeah. So yeah, they definitely had a very big influence on me, but um, not. Uh, they haven't no, scarred you. They haven't or... scarred me. No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't No scars. <laughs> Your but, own personal hell would not be oh, no. a bunch of nuns. Oh, no, no, no. no. And by the way, I've known some nuns who are just the loveliest people in the world. Right. Nicest people in the world. Well, uh, moving from nuns, I guess, in The Sound of Music, uh, What uh, one other show you told me was Best Performance. What yes. is Best Performance? It's My Star Spangled Girl. Just as Neil Simon had a Star Spangled Girl where he was writing about people that he didn't know. Mm -hmm. That is a script I'm writing where I really, I, I love, okay, Best Performance. Part of it was the title. That was the original title of All About Eve was Best Performance. Mm -hmm. I steal everybody's rejected titles. They throw a title out, I'll use it. And so I, it, it, it is, I've got to rework that show because it's a story about an actress and an actor. In fact, I have a poster designed for it already. In fact, a friend of mine in uh, uh, who's uh, uh, in North Carolina, who's an artist, I said, I'm thinking of this show. Here's what I have. In fact, I'll bring it and show it to you that poster. Cool. Um, but it's about a, an actress 
who wins an Oscar and what that effect is on her life. Then Neil Simon beat me to the punch and wrote that as the second scene in California Suite hmm. about an actress who loses an Oscar and what that of course, that has on her relationship with her husband. So uh, that's very much in its working stages. In fact, the publicity for it is already out, but I haven't got a full script yet. Hmm. And well, a full script that I've ever put on stage, let's put it like that. I never go into rehearsal with it yet, but I like it. When you talk about your uh, your experiences and how you write things. I always think of that quote. I think I've said it to you a few times of a creative genius is judged by the obscureness of their sources, which I think that really, I feel like that mm -hmm. pertains to your life more than a lot mm -hmm. of people. Uh, I don't know where I was going with that, but I just thought I like I it. Know, it's, another, it's, yeah. We started off the, what did we say in the beginning? That was the, the knowledge, the drop of knowledge. I said, uh, none of us are getting younger. Right. <laughs> and it's now, right up there with that. 46 minutes later, I've dropped that one. Yeah. But that one, that one that's good. I like that one. That's Maybe good. That'll that's be good. A, That'll be title of my book about being a bad person. <laughs> well, I see the New York Times bestseller <laughs> list right now. Blasting it off. It'll be great. Have you noticed that everyone gets a New York Times bestseller? I feel like yeah. every book that comes out is that. I don't know what that's about. Well, not every book. I, I swear it's almost every book. You could be like, oh, there's, you know, uh, Neil Patrick Harrison's story about him getting lost in the woods. And that's the New York Times bestseller. And you're like, I don't No one. I've never no heard of that book. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. There uh, must be a loophole. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, now that we talked about that for a second, <laughs> we've had, you've had a lot of students go on to do mm -hmm. some big things mm -hmm. uh, and you stay in touch with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of back on Heaven Ajar, you mm -hmm. had students that leave the school and go on to teach. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your experience with people learning from you and then what you see them take from well what i like is when a student and i'm most genuine when i say this what i like is when a student goes on and totally surpasses me hmm. in terms of knowledge in terms of success in terms i just i just i i i, I love that uh and so that's always been nice because one of my very favorite, my favorite musical is The King and I, which of course is about a teacher. And in the lyrics of getting to know you in the verse, it says, when you become a teacher by your students, you'll be taught. Hmm. Wow. And I love learning from my students. In fact, I've always said this. You see, I have the most interesting job in the world in terms of learning because every day, I go down in front of a classroom of teachers disguised as students. Hmm. And I absolutely, in fact, I'm going to say that at my retirement party. So <laughs> that, that you, you, you've heard, you don't have to come to my retirement party now. You heard the line. But, uh, but I, I love this because, you know, I'm always learning something new and where I'm learning it from is from students. You know, and not only just knowledge, but technical stuff, because I can't turn on my computer unless Caden's here to show me where to push the button. He's getting really good at it, though. I'm about to lose a job. <laughs> <laughs> you you know, it's a old dog, new tricks. Yeah. But, but you like you said, you're always learning. You're always taking something new from. And that's why I can't retire, because if I retire, I'll go home and just sleep in till eight o'clock every morning and go, OK, can I watch a rerun of Matlock? You know, I can't do that. Uh, I got to get to school where, you know, somebody can push me, tickle my brain, do something, hmm. challenge. You know, it's great. Uh, the only thing we haven't really done today is talk about uh, Kevin Norfleet. <laughs> Who is now I'm laughing. And if Kevin <laughs> sees this, you know, Kevin Norfleet is one of my very favorite uh, actors I've ever directed. Mm -hmm. He is now the drama teacher at Wichita North. How lucky are they? Mm -hmm. And how lucky are those students to have that caliber of not only person, but that caliber of talent mm -hmm. uh, teaching them? He is, um, he played, brings up, he played John Coolidge for me in mm -hmm. Angel's Charge and he was definitive. I've had 
three John Coolidge's and respectfully to the other two, John and Mike, um, Kevin was the best. Well, he was definitive. Definitive. Okay. Yeah. Don't his, say the his, best. yeah. Cause the other two are great. Mm -hmm. They were great. In fact, uh, Mike won best actor when he did the role, but Kevin did too. Yeah. One of the only two times in the history of Spelvins it was unanimous vote. So you know, after, you know, the accountant showed that to me, I went, well, I guess. No, he, uh, Kevin is uh, a person I respect so much, a former student from whom I can learn so much. And he is a uh, fine person, mm -hmm. fine guy. I hope Kevin's watching. Me too. Because, you know, I just kind of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that seems like it was so very ta just tacked on. Yeah, right? it was. But, but I, I like it. I think we needed it. Yeah, we needed me to talk about a student. That's and right. if there's any student I'd love to talk about, it's someone of Kevin's caliber. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> we've been here after a few philosophy lessons. It's about 50 minutes in. Uh, but is just uh, to throw this on you real quick at the end, is there any other experience of maybe writing or of just, you know, overall creativity that you mm -hmm. that comes to mind? Oh, that's, oh, wow. Now, you know, of course, after the interview, I'll think of five. That's right. But uh, I should have dropped this question on him at the very beginning. Yeah, exactly. And come so back. then come back and think about it. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, it's, what's interesting is that there are hidden gems, which I have found all over mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the Coolidge play came from my parents had a National Geographic magazine on the coffee table because mm -hmm. we didn't have TV. We just, you know, uh, those kinds of things. And it's, it's interesting that uh, where the ideas come from, there are riches all around you in terms of ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's just wonderful. Like I'll, I'll go out this afternoon, go to Walmart and I'll see something happen, you know, some event and it's sort of like, well, there's a play there. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, no, uh, I, I would just say what I, I the, the experiences that I've had is that I just love it because they're hidden under rocks, mm -hmm. metaphorically speaking just lift up the rock and uh it's it oh best way to put it dorothy said it in the Wizard of oz which i recently she recently saw a production of that it is. is that if you, you have not lost if it's not in your own backyard you haven't lost it mm -hmm. so you know just keep looking in your backyard so uh, that really didn't answer the no, question that's, that, I, that, I think that almost that wrapped up that you know put mm -hmm. a summary on everything we've talked right. about is, right you know where you get your ideas yeah uh, in my own backyard. In your own backyard. That's yeah. your book. Exactly. That's the name of the book. In That's my own in, backyard. In my own backyard. We found it. That's terrific. Well, it only took a whole podcast to find it, but well, it was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Peterson. Thank you for coming on the podcast for the second time. You're our first returning guest. Wow. Do I get a plaque on the wall or sure. something? Or <laughs> well, a gift certificate to Brahms well, or something? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you a free ice cream cone at McDonald's. Fab fabulous. And a pat on the back. That's great. <laughs> if you want to know more about Mr. Peterson, you can go back and look at our first episode with him. Uh, I don't remember what. I think it's 19. I've just, I'm just going to stick with 19. Let's go with that. And uh, also you can, if you want to see even more and personal things with him, we have the Delta Psi Omega page, which is the Greek or the fraternity of right. the Butler's Theater. And I also I run that page. So if you want to see some more stuff with Mr. Peterson, go check that out on Facebook and Instagram. And finally, if you want to support the Seeking Context podcast, uh, check out our website. And also in the description on this video, there is a Buy Us a Coffee link, which is just a very easy donation site. Uh, you, you can contribute a dollar, you can contribute five, you can contribute none. It's just if you want to support us, you can try that out. And uh, we'd really appreciate it. Well, again, thank you. Thank you. For, this has been great. You're very good at this, by the way. Thanks. I, you know, I'm no, going. No, it's all very good. I think, as I said in the beginning, I think I'm only good at interviewing you because this is the only. <laughs> The only, person you've interviewed. the only person I've interviewed twice now. <laughs> <laughs> Give him the local barber. He's dead. So. <laughs> You're my golden goose of podcasts. So we'll just keep interviewing I'll accept you that. until I'll accept the that. end of time. All right. Well, thank you all for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ooh, there it goes. There it goes. <laughs>